Thank you, Professor Reyes. And thank you for everyone to be here. Can everyone hear me? Okay, thanks. So today we're going to do an approach of Javier Garcia Marquez. My name is Fernando Gonzalez. We got Beth Foster and Karen Ortiz. And before we get started, I just want to mention out that he was born in 1928 and died last year in 2014. And he is from Aracataca, Colombia. In this PowerPoint, we're going to be talking about his past, his style of writing, his themes in his work, and we're going to include some short stories and novels, such as El Coronel No Tiene Que Le Escriba, Los Funerales de Mamá Grande, La Mala Hora, Del Amor y Otros Demonios, and Cien Años de Soledad, and we're going to end up with our conclusion. Let's start with his childhood. So he had a big family. He was the oldest of 12 children. And the parents were really poor, which causes this to give him away to his grandparents to feed him and educate him. During his teenage year, he started his writing. Writing. And their professor acknowledged this unique talent on him. So they enrolled him to scholarships to the university in which he made it to the University of Columbia in which he studied uh, law and journalism. After his college life, he also did some little, little works, plays, and movie scripts. He also became a controversial figure because of his friendship to some humanists and socialists all over Latin America. And finally, all this hard work paid off by winning the Nobel Prize in 1982. And here's a short list of his novels and short stories. Now moving on to passing the torch. I want to talk about a little bit about Miguel de Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote de la Mancha, which was the first mo mo modern novel of the 17th century of the Golden Age in the Spanish literature, while Gabriel García Márquez, with Cien Años de Soledad, became the best contemporary novel of the 20th century. In these two novels, Cervantes and García Márquez, use hyperbolic language, overwhelming imagination, and bizarre situations throughout the novels. Okay. Magic realism was a technique that Gabriel Garcia Marcus used in many of his works and novels. Um, the definition that Gabriel Garcia used to kind of explain magic realism was that magical realism expands the categories of the real so as to encompass myth, magic, and other extraordinary phenomena in nature or an experience which European realism excluded. Um, for example, Gabriel Garcia's Marcus created his own town called Macondo, which is in many of his novels, and this is where many of the techniques of magic realism take place. Garcia's Marcus was in a generation called the Boom Generation. This Boom Generation was a huge literary, literary step for Latino America and Colombia at that time. It took, around, it took place around the 60s. And it has other authors such as Carlos Fuentes, Julio Cortazar, y Maria Vargas Llosa. Um, Garcia Marquez is considered the greatest influence of the Green Generation. So the reader really has to participate in order to understand, I guess, magical realism. The reader has to read between the lines to try and find out what Garcia Marquez is trying to say, has to have a foreknowledge of this technique, understand what it is, and lastly, it has to understand kind of his exaggerated language and understand what was happening in Colombia and Latin America at that time. The themes that he uses are violence and corruption, poverty, hope and resistance, solitude, power, fantasy reality, love and sex, and time and repetition. To begin with, the okay, there we go. Sorry, guys. 
apologize for that one. Now, to begin with, to introduce how his themes play part in throughout his novels is with El Coronel no tiene quien escriba, no one writes for the coronel. So the main, the protagonist in this story is the coronel, which is a veteran, and his has been waiting for his pension over 56 years. Now, he lives in, in a small island where mail only gets here, gets there once a, a week, and so it's on a Friday. So he always thinks, this Friday I will get a pension, and that's when we bring in the theme of hope. He hopes for something better. He always aims that this Friday will be my Friday and I will get a pension and life will be good. However, he does face his, um, his obstacles, his antagonists, very, one of the biggest ones being his wife. She represents the reality while he represents the fantasy, the illusion of a perfect life, the life will be better. But she is, the, she is his practical, she tells him, you know, your pension didn't get here 56 years ago. It's not going to get here this Friday, nor the next, nor the following. We needed to survive now, not later, but now. What are we going to do? And he says, if my pension's not here, we have the rooster that will win the fight at the end of the month. Now, the rooster symbolizes one of the greatest deals in the novel because he does represent his son. His son raised the rooster when he was still alive. However, during the time, since they wanted news from the, out the outside world, they wanted to see what greater good, what could they look forward to, he would pass around clandestine papers just to let the town people know, you know, this is what's going on, this is what government is explaining to us, and so forth. However, the mayor had soldiers around the town which killed people who were passing around these papers, and his son got killed in the process of that. So, um, the coroner stays with the rooster, and now, not only that, does the rooster represent hope to him, but it also represents the hope of the town. Now, the whole town is rather poor, and all they can do, with the best way to explain it, is all they can do is hope. That they hope that the rooster is healthy enough to fight the game. They hope he will win the fight, and everything will be good. And, not, and there's so many times that we also play this time, this cycle of time of repetition, that he says his wife finally thinks that she sticks in the reality and says, okay, it's time to sell the rooster, it's time to face reality. But then he, he talks to his friends, he talks to the town, he's like, no, don't lose the rooster. He's our hope, you don't understand. This is our hope. And then he comes right back again with hope, and it's like, no, things, life will be good. And not only that, he has dignity that prospers throughout the whole story. And at the end, he definitely comes out and says, you know what, this is my dignity, this is my pride. Life will be good. It will be okay. Okay. So in another novel, The Malaora, we see here that the main theme is violence. Violence is run rapid throughout this book. We s the, it starts out with a man named Cesar Montero. He reads a notice that was posted outside that says his wife is having an affair with this young man. And so what Cesar Montero does is he goes and kills this young man. The notice that Cesar Montero read is called a lampoon, or a satirical notice. <coughs> These lampoons or satirical notices are <coughs> in other Garcia Marquez's works as kind of seen papers. Um, lampoons represent kind of repressing the government, trying to resist the government, oppressing them. Another, uh, another thing that Garcia Marquez uses to categorize is the, the priest. The priests in this story are often used to symbolize the church. In this story, he focuses on one priest in particular named the Father Anthony. He explains that the Father Angel, even though he has good intentions and he wants to help the people, that really he doesn't do anything to, I guess, confront the government. And that's the same with the other priests in the stories. Lastly, we see the injustice by the mayor in the story. The mayor wants justice. He wants to bring all these people who are writing these lampoons to justice. And he goes and wrongly accuses them. And he tortures them and ends up killing them in very final points. Okay, now we're going to be talking about Los Funerales de, Bama, de Mama Grande, Rick's Mama Funeral, which consists of eight short stories. I only chose three because they're more intense so of Gabriel Garcia Marquez and they're more easy to identify. Let's start with La Siesta del Martes. Here we have two things, prejudice and injustice. I'm going to start with the prejudice, which applies to Everyone in the town, which they take, a, they punish an outsider just because 
and all the ATs that he was killing. We're not sure exactly that what happened, or if he's doing that. We just have the idea of the lady that says he was killing him, so I, sh I shouldn't today. His mom finds out about this situation and tries to go and visit him where he was buried. And pretty much the cemetery and the church are together, so she has to go to the church first in order to go to the cemetery. So she goes to the church, see this priest, and because he was an outsider, this priest doesn't wanna wanna help her out, give her the closest to his son, which is kinda odd. And now moving on to La Prodigiosa Tarde de Baltasar. In this story, we see four men in Lucians that want to sell a cage bird to the richest person in the town. Something that no one has done, you know, pretty much no one ever done before, and he wants to be the first one to do such a thing. That didn't happen, and that's when pride comes to it, and pretty much this person says, okay, you don't, wanna, you don't want me to sell this cage, I'm just gonna give it to your son as a gift. And also, it's also in pride comes to this poor person by giving orders in the richest houses of the town, and um, my bad, let me take that back. He also pretty much commands the house of other people, which also pray to him, to show him to, to the richest person that he doesn't need to be rich in order to give commands to others. Now let's talk about Un Dia de Estos. We have two main charges in this one, a dentist and a mayor. We're not sure exactly how things work out, but throughout violence and killing people, the mayor gets his position by killing the officers and people that are gonna go against him. We're not sure exactly how he did it, doesn't play that much, but we have to interpret between the lines to get to this point. So one day, he just felt kind of sick and he wants one of his tooth to be removed, so he goes to the dentist. So he shows up to the dentist, come out and tell her to take out the tooth in order to put some revenge into it, the dentist told him that he doesn't have any medications for the pain. So he has to do it just like that. And pretty much we know that he does it. And in his mind, he just think about, now it's your time to pay about at least 20 people that you kill. Now we bring ourselves to Cien Almas de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude. This novel was published in 1967. It received the Nobel Prize in 1982. The way it is recognized one of the best novels and representational of the magic realism during the boom generation is the type of techniques that Garcia Marquez used in this novel. For example, films, um, authors like William Faulkner, as far as inspiration, chronicles such as Mariners, soldiers, missionaries, how they, when they wrote, they wrote about these extravagant new worlds and this just Florence's of something new. And it's all magic realism. Now, the best way this novel it is described here with McNeer is from a wider perspective, it represents the history of Colombia and Latin America, even of humanity from Genesis to Apocalypse. The way it's just, what is trying to be explained here is that this novel is centralized in one family, Buendia which is in the town of Macondo. They are the founders of the town, and they go through six generations. They start off with greatness and saying, yes, we have found our town, we are gonna expand, we are gonna succeed. We have two main characters, Ar um, Arcadio and Arueliano, which are the sons of the founders who, of the town. Now, both sons represent different type of characters of the father. And so, the way the story becomes more complex, explaining magic realism, is that they confuse each other, they confuse each other's personalities, the characteristics, and how the worlds are played. Now, throughout the years, they start bringing in um, the outer world, trying to just expand the town. However, all this greatness then comes to destruction. Now, towards the end of the novel, there's a huge storm, wipes out all the people, and we start again with the cycle of repetition in time, beginning again with only the Wendia family, and Aruelliana reads this prophecy saying that the town who has it as happiness will start with greatness and soon will end with destruction and sadness. 
not only this, one thing that can be summarized through is that um, Alcalde Averiano is fought wars, and he always lost all of them. But this comes to a little representation of how Colombia and the Latin American fought for their life, fought for having something better for the following day, which brings humanity. Now, another thing is that the book really resembles itself in the search of the truth. We always go in the cycle of searching for the truth, but then we can always end up at the same place as we started at. And this is the book that's known as one of the best works from the boom generation. Now, we also have this character's outline, which helps the reader rather understand a little bit more easily the six generations of sentence of the 100 years of solitude. However, throughout the book itself, it will just fall apart. So it's just how we start off, but towards the end, we all start from scratch again, and we start the whole chart in a different whole way. Yeah. 20 years after seeing Agnes de Soledad, Ursus Marcus wrote another novel called De la Moria um, In this novel, it takes place in the 16th century and focuses, focuses on a young girl named Sierra Maria. Sierra Maria was abandoned by her parents and was raised by African slaves. These African slaves taught her the dialects and the culture which they had. The, main, the central theme in this is injustice, and Sierra Maria is treated as a victim in this. After a while, her father decides to kind of take her back and felt guilty about abandoning her in the first place. He, he tries to get her to live the royalty life. He notes that she had been bitten by a dog who had later died of rabies four days later. In talking with the bishop and, and asking him advice, the bishop says that she does not have rabies, but is rather possessed by a demon. The bishop convinces Sierra Maria's father to send her to the covenant, the covenant of Santa Clara, which in this covenant represents the oppression. It basically takes away her happiness and anything that she wants. Um, Cayetano, which is bishop, the bishop's right-hand man, is actually in charge of her exorcism. And so he goes and tries to see her, see if she's really possessed or not. In the process, he ends up falling in love with her, and she with him. However, the tragic conclusion is that when he's trying to see, sneak into her cell, he's, and he gets captured and is sent off to work with the lepers. Sarah Maria waits and waits for him, but he never comes. Then, finally, she's brutally tortured and killed by force of exorcism. All right, so to our conclusion, we have known that Garcia Marquez has been influenced by the Chronicles, the, Golden, the Spanish Golden Age films, um, as well as authors like William Faulkner and many more. Now, he, used, uh, he utilizes hyperbolic language, which is extravagant imagination just to make his legendary space and time and use a critique in the status quo, such as, such as the government, the church, the economy, the social status, and so forth. Now, the way he represents it is through the imaginations, through the hope of the people and the characters that always expect for something new, they always hope for something new, and just brings in the fantasy and reality of magical realism. Now, one of the best ways to sum up one of his greatest work, the greatest example of during the boom generation, is San Manuel de Solera with magic realism. Now we have come to the end of our presentation. Um, thank you guys very much for attending our group and now we can start with the question. Yes? I forgot the full title, but uh, it was Mama's Eight Funerals or? It was Eight Short Stories. Mama's Big Funeral is based on Eight Short Stories. Okay. Um, maybe I missed it a while. I guess, where did the title come from? Is that, is there also, and also, there's a short story included too, same, same oh. name. I'm a yeah. big spiral. Um, one thing to mention too is that Garcia Marquez draws all his stories from childhood experiences. He grew up with his grandmother talking to him about extravagant stories, and that's how he kind of comes up with his characters and just expands them throughout his world. So, yes? So why did you guys choose? Yes, sir. Okay, so we are actually at this moment, we are also taking a class about Garcia Marquez. But not just because we're taking the class, but the fact that he actually set up one of the greatest examples, one of the greatest stepping stones in Latin American literature.
to help us understand, to better expand ourselves, and is one of the greatest ways to help us understand its literature itself. So. How do you think Gabriel Garcia Marquez lives in the majority of his life outside of Colombia, um, in the area of all places, where he's supposed to be? How do you think that living outside of what were these experiences of his childhood includes the way in which he lived? Well, I think one way is that, you know, it's not just in Colombia that these tragic violent things happen, but throughout all Latin America. So he's not only a voice for Colombia, but a voice for all Latin America as well. So drawing experiences of traveling around the world have him draw, drawn this illusion when we mentioned the whole island, there's people live in an island, and they always receive news from the outside world. And it's one of the greatest ways to explain that in that perspective from him.